What is a database schema? A database schema describes the structure of a database and is used to define how the database is constructed and how the data is organized. A database schema is written in a formal language such as SQL, which is used to describe tables, columns, constraints, fields, relationships, and more. We talked about SQL last time, structured query language, and it's used for relational databases because it's structured. And with this, uh, with the SQL, with the SQL, we can define how the tables are constructed and how they're organized using columns, constraints, fields, relationships, and more. It's a way of creating a blueprint for your database. That's essentially it, right? If you if if you think of schema, think of blueprint as well as access controls and, and and whatnot. Key benefit of using and maintaining a database schema is to document how the database is structured. Database engineers and administrators can read the database schema and understand how the data is organized. So if you are a DBA or if you if you know anything about databases and web developers really should they will be able to read a database schema and understand how the data is stored, how it's structured, how the relationships between the data without actually seeing the data. By just reading the database schema, they'll be able to see how the tables are laid out, what is connected to what, where are the keys, what kind of rules are in place for the, the data to, to be stored and to be queried. So without actually having any data in the database, a DBA will be able to do all those kind of things when they read the, the schema. Once the database has been structured using a database schema, the data becomes more accessible due to the data separation of tables and other logic structures. Information pulled from the database can then be siloed into data models. So we could have a, cl a class that represents the, the table in the database. So here I'm kind of alluding to like um, an object relational model where we have our, if you're in, a, in the PHP world, for instance, you may have doctrine entities, which represent the, the data in a table. And you can then use those to translate the raw data into an object in PHP, for instance. I'll just say that again. Once the database has been structured using a database schema, the data becomes more accessible due to the data separation of tables and other logical structures. Information pulled from the database can then be siloed into models. I think what I'm going to do is I'll do an explainer like this where we talk about models because there, there, there's more to it than that, right? In, in that sentence, there's more to models than than just storing data. We can talk about the boundaries of where a model lives, lies, where where a model doesn't become a model anymore because it's something else. But anyway, that, that may be for another time. Database schemas also enforce data integrity as they set constraints, define required fields, data types, and relationships. This means that data administrators can be confident in the integrity of the data as each transaction will adhere to rules and structures defined by the schema. When you create your database schema, you are defining the constraints and the required fields, the data types of the data that are required for each of the tables and whatnot. And you're, you are literally setting rules in place for, you know, this data must have this, this data must be in this form, that kind of stuff. This data is linked to this data using this connection, that kind of you know boundary setting there. Uh, so this means that database administrators can be confident in the integrity of the data as each transaction will adhere to the rules and structure defined by the schema. So for example, you can't just insert any random record. You can, you've got to insert, insert a record that conforms to how the data needs to be stored, how the data is set out in the schema of the table. Like for example, it has to have perhaps a first name. This person has to have a first name because it's not nullable. Or it has to have bio and that bio has to be less than this amount of characters, that kind of stuff. There has to be a, a, a tiny int that d d denotes whether or not it's active or not. There has to be a birth date that kind of stuff. And this birth date needs to be in this format. So we are really getting quite rigid with how 
the data is enforced. As the data is stored in a consistent and structured manner, there can be compliance with ACID tests. Now, we're not going to go down the ACID tests rabbit hole today. It, we'll probably do it at some other point, but it means essentially that you everything is kind of as i mentioned it's 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 individual it's siloed it can be tested as as a single thing and then what i've got here I, i'm gonna just go over to this browser window here apologies for those uh listening but what i'm doing at the moment is i'm just bringing up uh, how to build a database schema showing Microsoft Ignite. This is a, a website here. And if we scroll down, we can actually see a schema in this form here where we are creating a schema called Sprockets. We're authorizing Joe and we're creating a table called Nine Prongs. These are the, the, the fields. Uh, we're also defining a data type for each one of these. So source is an int, cost is an int, part number is an int. And then we're um, dealing with some some grants, so we're granting the access to Bob to select, and we're denying John the ability to select off of this as well. So this is an example of how we can create a schema that defines this table and how we can actually limit the access as well. So in this example, we are defining a schema called Sprockets and giving the user auth Joe authorization. A table called Nine Prongs is created with the field source, cost, and part number. Each field is designated a data type and user access is defined. MySQL, the SQL there, it, it is different because we're no longer talking about MSSQL, we're talking about MySQL, but the structure of the, the way the language is laid out is very similar. So we create a table. We have a series of fields on that table and those fields have a series of rules we define their data types and we define their constraints we define how that you know the char set the foreign keys all of that kind of stuff we do that when we create the table and when we create the table we are creating the schema for that that's a that's a discussion on sql but what about no sql because does NoSQL have a database schema? Well, even though a non-relational database does not have a formal structure, it can still be defined as having a dynamic schema. A, a NoSQL schema will explain the structure of each document, and this can be altered for future documents. These future documents are held in the database. Um, as NoSQL cannot include foreign keys, its schema doesn't define any relationships or constraints between the data. And what I'm going to do is I'll just demonstrate this. We'll go over to uh, MongoDB, which is something that I've used before, uh, which is a fantastic piece of kit for uh, NoSQL. And this is an example of a schema here. So we're setting the const. Again, apologies for those listening. What I'm, what I'm doing is I'm going to Mongo. Uh, db.com and there is a an example here of a database schema where we have a blog and we're defining the the structure of the blog obviously it's going to be a very loose structure because it's no sql where we've got uh, things like the title the slug the published the author the content the tags uh, the created dates and the comments so these are the fields and we're also defining the data types of those fields so Title and slug, they are strings. Published is a, is a Boolean. Author is a string. So is content. The tags, however, are a string within an array. So it's an array of strings. And the created and updates, updated at are both dates. Now, the interesting thing comes, comes when we get to the comments. The comments is actually an object of itself. It's an array of objects where we have the user and the content of the comment and the votes, votes being a number, content being a string, and so is the user. But we have the ability to have multiple ones of those within this single schema. Now, if this was a, a, a structured query language, we would have a separate table called comments where we would have an ID for the blog in the comment. So we would say this comment has this blog ID. So this comment is for this blog, right? Whereas what we're doing here is we're saying, no, this blog is actually a document and this document also contains all of its comments, which means that this document contains everything we need for this blog. 
including all of the things that are perhaps one could see from a SQL point of view as an external piece of data, i.e. the comments. So an interesting idea that I've got for howtocodewell.net is recommendations of tutorials and courses based on what the user has previously seen, viewed, right? So I would need some form of, of way of capturing that, saying like this user has seen this course and has read this article and this tutorial and listened to this podcast, right? <clears throat> Off the back of that, I could perhaps um, recommend different tutorials, different courses, different podcasts based on what the user has seen previously. Now, there's probably no reason for me to store all of this information in a structured query language in, say, MySQL, because this is very unique to the person and it's not really going to offer me any kind of benefit in terms of any kind of analytics. However, uh, it's certainly going to be tailored to the specific person. And if that data suddenly disappears, then it's not going to break the system, is it? So what I'm thinking is, is having some form of relation where this article has been uh, suggested based on this podcast that was listened to or this course that was listened to. And I then I can perhaps see uh, more from an analytical point of view, you know, maybe the users prefer these kind of tutorials, maybe they're, they're they want to lean more on JavaScript and maybe these users perhaps more in terms of PHP or Docker. So that analytics could work, but in terms of how we capture that information per user, we could have a, a document like what I've just shown you in the Mongo example, MongoDB example, where we could have the user and we could define a schema that is very loose and can be adapted and can be updated every time they view a different piece of content. And it would basically become a recommendation engine. It's a recommendation engine, essentially, uh, but using a very fluid, dynamic storage engine, albeit, you know, possibly MongoDB, maybe Redis, that kind of stuff, where it, that kind of information, if that gets stored in a SQL engine, a SQL database, Essentially, what I'm going to have is just a series of linker tables with a bunch of IDs. It's not really going to give me any kind of benefit to that. So that's an idea, maybe, of how I can use NoSQL on howtocodewell.net. But anyway, going back to this example of MongoDB, the, the example that I've just shown demonstrates and defines the properties. So we can see that the properties and their data types have been defined. And notice the schema is more flexible compared to the SQL example that I showed you previously. Um, a document's property can be a collection of other objects as shown by the comments, as I mentioned before. In terms of, say, the how to code well thing, we would perhaps have user and the user would have recent articles, recent tutorials, recent podcasts, that kind of stuff. Like maybe if this, this gets all captured and then in the background, we then decide, well, well, actually they, they are more PHP orientated, more JavaScript orientated, more Docker orientated. And so what, what I'm thinking is having like this storage where uh, this gets, this, this gets uh, populated, a collection of uh, the recent articles, comments, and uh, sorry, articles, tutorials, and courses, a collection of each one of these per user, right? And then we send that up to uh, an API and the API then comes back with recommendations based or suggestions based on the collection. And the collection will be ever changing and the suggestions will be ever improving. That is kind of my thought process of how I could use MongoDB in step with an API, which then returns suggestions. And I was thinking like, how would I do this? Like, how am I gonna suggest users new content? And I'm thinking, well, maybe we could do it by tagging content, PHP, JavaScript, tagging content, databases, that kind of stuff. And then I can then go through the collections and work out, well, they've looked at more PHP stuff. They've looked at more database stuff. They've looked at more JavaScript stuff. And so I'm going to return them back more of those kind of things. But in terms of the storage on the front end, maybe MongoDB is probably best suited for that. I may have to do, I may do this on a live stream. Who knows? But yeah, that's my explainer for database schemas. They are a way of structuring your database and making your database more rigid and dealing with user access.
dealing with the constraints, dealing with how the data is linked from one thing to the other. Yeah, that is that. Is that. And I, what I'll do is I'll probably uh, write this as an article itself, and I've got a load of like uh, resources on this too. But uh, yeah, I'm going to, as you can probably tell, my throat is getting worse, so I'm going to call it, and uh, I will... I will see you again next time. Thank you ever so much for watching. Happy coding. And hey, one thing I haven't even mentioned yet, which I really should have done right at the start. This is a members only live chat. So if you if you want to consider supporting How to Code Well, and if you want to get involved in the podcast, then please do consider joining uh, the, mem the members for How to Code Well. Uh, also, when you do join, you'll also get uh, early access to the podcast because once this goes live once this gets once the live stream is finished i'm going to just set this to members only until it gets published to in in the audio form but you also get uh you also get the tutorials that haven't been released yet and also for the higher tiers you also get all of the courses that i was showing you earlier uh, so you can access those, you know, without without having to go to howtocowell.net and paying for them. And uh, uh, as always, if you've got any suggestions for next content, if you've got any other questions or queries, then please do uh, let me know either in the YouTube comments or go to howtocowell.net forward slash content and let me know there. If you've got any ideas for what you want to learn next, then that's all welcome. Thanks again, everyone. Happy coding. And I'm going to just uh, rest my throat for the rest of the day. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.